so this is a talk mostly about the spelling of intersource, but inevitably a little bit of the history of intersource gets built in there too. Um, so first to introduce myself, um, for those of you who might not know me, I founded Intersource Commons in 2014 while I was working at PayPal. Um, I, before that, spent kind of a long time working on open source, um, basically 1998 until now. And um, be, along the way, I became known as the Intersource Diva briefly. Um, and Intersource Commons, or sorry, the Open Source Diva, Intersource Commons is my give back to the open source community for a variety of reasons that we'll discuss when we get into the talk. Um, so uh, I want to start by saying that I have a long and storied career, and not all of it was in open source. I spent a fair amount of time working for some famous proprietary companies like uh, Apple and uh, Microsoft, and then Apple again, before Sun hired me to open source Java. And um, I can tell you from long experience and a lot of consulting that most of the tech giants that you know pull most of the money in our industry actually do not do a very good job of using inner source practices or what I would call modern, modern development practices um, as they evolved from the open source community. They tend to overemphasize um, the wrong things in the interest of controlling the very large population of, of computer programmers that they have. When I first joined PayPal, there was a project to try to unify all of the different efforts to, to upgrade the PayPal experience. Um, they got really bad at killing off the previous one. So they had five possible ways that you might find yourself experiencing PayPal, depending on how you logged in, where you logged in. And um, anyway, this was a really, really important initiative. So of course there were 3000 engineers working on it. <laughs> And I came home and told my husband this, and he, he went, oh my God, what are they going to get done with 3,000 engineers? Because if you're actually an engineer, you know that the more, the more the people involved, the kind of less clean the process is going to be and the more dubious the outcome will be. Um, so the knowledge that people had it wrong and that simultaneously there were not enough people that knew how to do open source and we were having a sustainability problem in open source around maintainership and finding, finding the right people to come on board. We couldn't really build them fast enough, uh, open source participants, um, certainly not through schools. Uh, you only get about 100,000 engineers a year out of, out of the world's schools. And um, most of them are taught to do you know, visual basic programming, which I would argue is not really programming. So, um, you know, this is this is the pressing problem that I was trying to trying to fix. Um, in 2014, which was my first year at PayPal, we had an OSCON booth for the first time, and um, it was the biggest booth. It was right in the front of the store, um, and it was a surprise to many people that we were there. Um, in researching for this talk, I found some blog posts of, where people had taken a picture of our booth and said, "Is this even a good idea?" <laughs> which I think is funny. Um, at the time, you'll notice all the couches. We were the only people providing uh, seating and, and a place you could plug in your laptop on the expo floor. So we were basically mobbed all the time, which I find really interesting as well. But um, this was about announcing that PayPal cared about open source. And they cared about it mostly because they were making a major shift to using Node.js. Um, this same year, 2014, I got involved in saving Node from itself because the people who wrote it were young and frustrated by um, the timelines that big companies typically work with. And so they forked their own project and started another version. And they did it right at the time that the brand was rising and they didn't understand why that was a bad idea. So I got in there and, and helped them come back to unify the code base and allow Node to continue on the trajectory that it was on to be bigger than Java, which it achieved towards the end of 2014 when we got everything calmed down. Um, so um, I went home from that, from that meeting to a disgruntled employee at PayPal. He was pretty senior and he was getting ready to quit because he was so frustrated by the sheer amount of interrupt 
that he was experiencing in PayPal's culture. At the time, um, the way priority was established was kind of how loud your VP was and, and willing to fight, you know? Um, this is a drawing, uh, this isn't the first drawing I did, this is the second one of, of how to explain my idea of inner source, which is based on the way that Apache works. And um, interestingly enough that I captured this one, I, I got the other one as well, but it's harder to read. Um, all that stuff in red along the, the, the right corner, that's me starting to think about inner source commons. So I started thinking about this in 2014. And I remember the day after we started talking about putting up a website, I called Dwayne O'Brien um, on my way to work and said, Dwayne, I need you to immediately go to, um, select, to uh, secure the URL innersourcecommons.org. And he said, why are we doing that? And I said, because it occurs to me that this is not the only company that is gonna need the advice that we're gonna be giving PayPal. And um, it's gonna be a stronger statement if we market it outside in, meaning if the sheer number of companies that turn up, and that list is a list of companies I already knew about that were working on Intersource because as soon as I started talking about it at OSCON, people started coming up to me and saying, you know, how do I get in basically? Right. So um, next year we had our first keynote. So in 2015, and that year it happened to be an early OSCON um, in in or oh, sorry a late OSCON in, and in Portland. And um, these are the people that were in my keynote. Some of them on stage with me talking about getting started with Intersource. Getting started with Intersource was a book we wrote. Booklet, some of you may have seen it. It's actually the most downloaded non-code asset on GitHub still, I think. Um, and it is a 26 page narrative of how we did our first inner source experiment in PayPal and how successful it was because at this point we were still in the middle of it. So we didn't know what the end game was gonna be, but um, it's, it's a pretty good uh, primer if you've never seen it before. Um, we stood on stage and we also gave interviews and we also had a fair amount of interest from the press talking about why we would be doing this at OSCON since Intersource was designed to be done inside proprietary companies. And notice that I'm already spelling it in a camel case way. I'm gonna to get to that in a minute here, why we did that. But um, this was the first time that I experienced a lot of challenge to that spelling. People really wanted to understand why it wasn't two words and you know how to use it in a sentence because they were all writing articles. <laughs> And I started to realize, you know, sort of the, the, the um, situation I had wrought, if you will. So um, this is the first page of Intersource Commons when we wrote it. And uh, you'll notice we already had the logo. I'll tell that story in a minute. Um, this was an advertisement for the first summit, which was a few months after that initial um, coming out party at OSCON. We also had a big booth again and, and you know people there all the time, but uh, and lots and lots of that logo <laughs> everywhere. But um, this is what we promised people they would experience if they came to our offices in San Jose in November. And um, a fair number of people that are still involved with the community turned up to that meeting and were really you know interested. We also taught everybody how to juggle. We gave everybody a set of juggling balls with the logo on it. And uh, at OSCON, we also gave away juggling balls and we had people teaching how to juggle. And that was a conscious metaphor of what it's like to be a change agent inside of a big organization and how juggling might be a useful skill to acquire. Um, <clears throat> these are the people that were involved in putting that website up and they were also my team. So I'm gonna introduce you to them now. Um, some of you may recognize a younger, uh, but still uh, hair suit, um, Dwayne O'Brien, who now works as Indeed's uh, chief of open source. Uh, also in the middle there is Cedric Williams, our unsung hero who spent an awful lot of time um, being our treasurer and helping us build our website and generally be, you know, dogs bodying. And then Doug Crockford over there on the upper left, very famous in the JavaScript world. Um, I was assigned him and his two uh, interns uh, as a kind of side gig, I also owned accessibility at PayPal for a little while. Uh, they were just giving me enough people that I had 10 direct reports 
Um, but Doug was very involved in the drafting of, of Intersource Commons website. He did a lot of proofreading of the copy. Um, then down in the lower left, that is Rohit Harshandani, and the guy in the lower right is Ashish Ashadri. They were his two interns. They were mostly interested in what he was working on, but they actually did the lion's share of coding the website. And um, they showed up at that first conference where we announced Intersource and manned the booth and talked about extensively how much better it was to work that way because our group coded that way from the beginning. Um, Doug Crockford was really famous for saying, you should always code like your code is gonna be read by the world, whether or not it's being read by the world outside. So, um, and then the two ladies in the middle, one of them, Salona Bonewald, you may have seen around the playground. She actually joined us at this conference as in we hired her while we were there. But, you know, she was involved in an influence because I had worked with her before on a project for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we had similar ideas. And then Kanchana Welagadara, who uh, works in the finance industry still and talks about Intersource. She's spoken at several of our summits. She was working for me at the time as a, as a contractor and um, working directly with the teams that we were onboarding to do Intersource. So that was the team. Um, about the logo, the instructions that I gave to the guy who designed the logo were, I want a letter I in the logo. And I also wanted to seem like there's a party inside. <laughs> and of course, this is what he came up with the night before the launch. <laughs> And um, insiders will notice that I'm here using the, the improved Intersource logo. Most of the slides that you see from Intersource Commons use the original logo where the two um, side edges are a little shorter. It wasn't originally uh, drawn as a hexagon, although it was produced as a hexagon sticker. And that's when we had to fix it so that it would fit within a hexagon. Um, so, you know, the night before the launch, basically the website got all of its logos and, um, and, and also we, we harmonized the spelling. We specifically opted for the camel case. And here's why. Oh, camel case is what it's called when you put a capital letter in the middle of a long word that's a compound of two other words. So Opus, uh, OSCON was a cradle of open source. This is my thinking. The first OSCON that I went to was actually a PearlCon. They didn't change the name until um, 1999, 1990, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, until 2000, 1999, it was still PearlCon. And Pearl is a language that uses um, camel case inside. It's designed to use it. And that's partly because, uh, partly why their uh, mascot in the O'Reilly world became the camel. So why would you camel case? Well, um, there is a Wikipedia page that will tell you everything you want to know about camel case, which um, I decided not to include here because it's a pretty busy slide, but you can go look and see what it says. Basically, it says this is used a lot in the tech world. Think about iPhone is one or, um, or Apple Pay or any anytime you make a word out of two words, you make it easier to read by putting a capital letter in when you know the next word starts. And because the URL that we were able to secure was intersourcecommons.org. That's three words in a row, and it's kind of a lot of vowels. So putting those capitals in, which Google doesn't care about when it searches, um, makes it easier to read, uh, like as in Perl. But also, if you did a search in um, 2015 for the term intersource with a, period, with a space in the middle, you got a lot of really wifty you know, self-help things. Also, I didn't include it, but there was a company offering upper colonics, which is cleaning out your intestines, your inner source, right? But if you wrote it with one, one word, with or without the capitalization, you started finding things that actually belong to us. And I thought, well, this is a way to, to get around the fact that the term inner source is being used in other venues, not technical venues. And um, I also thought it might make it easier to trademark because I had worked for InterSource Initiative, or sorry, Open Source Initiative for 10 years. And one of the big problems for us was that the term open source was deemed non-trademarkable by um, the Patent and Trademark Office because it was two words with a space in between and they were common words. 
Now, in the time since they said no to open source, um, they decided that any aggregation of common words is, is going to be difficult to trademark. Uh, unless you are Apple or somebody. So they also didn't allow us to, inter to trademark intersource with or without the camel casing, but it still makes it easier to find things. Now, if you went and did the search that I showed you with all the, the crystal shops and, and, um, and meditation practices in the upper colonics, that is not a search you can do anymore because we've done a good job of, of promulgating the term. Um, but I still spell it with camel case because that is historically you know, how we did it. Um, so now a little primer from grammar teacher Denise. I actually was a grammar teacher. I, I taught English in the Peace Corps for two years in Morocco. So um, and I and I got good grades in English. So I feel like I can talk to you about this. Um, so here's some examples of things that make people uncomfortable, why they want to choose a different spelling. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in the conversation later. First of all, how does everybody feel about inner sourcing is so much fun. Yes, I am in fact making a verb out of a noun there. <laughs> That's called a gerund, very, very popular in, in the English language. And, um, you know, I don't have a problem with this, but there are a lot of academics that think this is a made up word and they don't want to get in trouble from their um, very careful style editors about using the term this way. And that's one of the main reasons that we see it spelled with space in it. Um, Here's another thing to think about. We are using intersource me methodology, so intersource as, a, as an adjective there, versus we want to intersource this. <laughs> now, what does everybody say? They all say the second thing. The, the first thing actually makes some of my colleagues, and especially some of the early people in the world of intersource, um, really cringe. Uh, so apparently for purists, methodology in inner source is not a methodology. It is a set of methods. <laughs> and um, so for a variety of reasons, that first sentence really hurts academics' feelings. Um, but they, I think some of them are starting to understand that we want to inner source this is, is going to happen, just like um, you know, we want to Xerox this happened, right? How about it's an inner source project? So there it's being used as an, as an adjective. I think that's pretty common. Uh, usage. And I think that we do see this one in academia, although they rarely spell it with a capital S in the middle. Um, is it intersourceable? Well, I hear that one out in the world. I, that, this one makes me cringe just a little bit, but, um, but I get it. People need to make it a verb and it's a noun. So what are we going to do about that? I don't think the spelling with the capital S actually hurts that thought. Um, but I'm not subject to English language style guides. I did have a fight with O'Reilly when we published uh, that first getting started with Intersource, which you'll notice was spelled properly uh, with the big S. Um, I, I, had to, I had to fight them on that. And Tim O'Reilly came to my aid, uh, the owner of O'Reilly and Associates, because he was the guy that started PearlCon. He gets camel casing. He liked it, actually. He used it a lot in his own writing. And so, um, yeah, he basically subsumed the, the style guide there. And then this one, I love this one. And in fact, um, if I had a choice of mascot for inner source, it would be a sorcerer. I love the idea that we are inner sorcerers. And um, I went looking for, I, I don't know if you guys know, probably Zach knows, GitHub has a, has a tool that they bring to conferences sometimes that lets you make your own Octocat. And I did one years and years ago um, back when my hair was red, uh, where, that looked like me, but she was in a sorcerer's costume, but she was still an octocat. <laughs> so um, I, I really like this idea because I think we are transforming the industry. And um, also, you know, we're kind of good sorcerers. We're making things generally better for everybody that gets involved with us. So, um, so hopefully this is, a, this is a good, you know, upper level uh, think about why I chose this spelling. I will say that I was challenged early on by some of the early people who attra were attracted to Intersource Commons, notably my, our good friend, Russ Rutledge, um, who is always on the path of the correct and, and is a great guy. I, I really like working with Russ. And I was able to persuade him with the Google argument. So he started long enough ago that you still got you know, whiffy candle purveyors and, and meditation practices if you looked up Intersource. 
uh, and the Kalanic people. So, um, you know, that's why we stuck with it through the critical, through this time. And now here we are, this is our eighth year um, and we've got enough material produced and enough people. I don't know if you realized in that, that set of, um, you know, here's if you, if you just search for inner sources, one word, and it showed things that related to us. Those were all talks that were not produced by inner source commons that they were listing there. So um, it's become a common term now, um, but we still see it misspelled all over town. The only time recently that I've been really picky about it was when IBM got involved because in the past, whatever IBM chose as a nomenclature became the accepted nomenclature just because of their gravitas. And so I had a brief conversation with them about why we do it the way we do it. Please stop spelling it the way you're spelling it. And they were very gracious to comply. So, um, so there you go. Uh, and now um, I think I spent, I'm ending just a tiny bit early, but I think we're going to have a lot of conversation about this topic. So I'm ready if you are.